Dr. Harcourt shivered. So, what you're saying is this is a horror podcast. My God, there could be adult language and situations inside. Pseudopod, episode 700. Oh yes, oh yes. April 24th, 2020. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast that cannot be harmed by conventional weaponry. My name is Alistair Stewart, I am your host, and it is my tremendous, epic pleasure to welcome you to our 700th episode. So, your author this week, brilliantly, genuinely needs no introduction. It's Edgar Allan Poe. Seriously, it's it's the guy. So I'm just going to skip over that and talk briefly about John Bell, our narrator. John is a former radio guy who has extensive experience in writing, voicing, and producing commercials, audiobooks, video game characters, and so on. Currently, he writes, voices, and produces the comedy podcast Bells in the Bat Free, available at iTunes, various other sources, and at thebatfree.com. Your author this week is, as I say, Edgar Allan Poe. He is one of the godfathers of contemporary horror, both in fiction and poetry form. You will have encountered his work before, almost certainly. The Cask of Amontillado, uh, The Fall of the House of Usher, that John Cusack film. You know, Poe is part of the foundations. And, well, we're going to talk about what that means in the end cap. But before then, uh, both Mr. Poe and Mr. Bell... And we have a story for you. And we all promise you, it's true. Hop Frog by Edgar Allan Poe Narrated by John Bell I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking. To tell a good story of the joke kind and to tell it well was the surest road to his favor. Thus it happened that his seven ministers were all noted for their accomplishments as jokers. They all took after the king, too, in being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as inimitable jokers. Whether people grow fat by joking, or whether there is something in fat itself which predisposes to a joke, I have never been quite able to determine. But certain it is that a lean joker is a rara avis in terris. About the refinements, or as he called them, the ghost of wit, the king troubled himself very little. He had an especial admiration for breadth in a jest, and would often put up with length for the sake of it. Over niceties wearied him. He would have preferred Rabelais' Gargantua to the Zadig of Voltaire, and, upon the whole, practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones. At the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. Several of the great continental powers still retained their fools, who wore motley with caps and bells, and who were expected to be always ready with sharp witticisms at a moment's notice in consideration of the crumbs that fell from the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool— The fact is, he required something in the way of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers, not to mention himself. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however. His value was trebled in the eyes of the king by the fact of his being also a dwarf and a cripple, Dwarfs were as common at court in those days as fools, and many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through their days, days are rather longer in court than elsewhere, without both a jester to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But, as I have already observed, your jesters, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, are fat, round, and unwieldy, so that it was no small source of self-gratulation with our king that, in Hopfrog— This was the fool's name, 
he possessed a triplicate treasure in one person. I believe the name Hop Frog was not that given to the dwarf by his sponsors at baptism, but it was conferred upon him by general consent of the several ministers on account of his inability to walk as other men do. In fact, Hop Frog could only get along by a sort of interjectional gait, something between a leap and a wriggle, a movement that afforded illimitimate amusement and, of course, consolation to the king. For, notwithstanding the protuberance of his stomach and a constitutional swelling of the head, the king, by his whole court, was accounted a capital figure. But although Hop Frog, through the distortion of his legs, could move only with great pain and difficulty along a road or floor, the prodigious muscular power which nature seemed to have bestowed upon his arms by way of compensation for deficiency in the lower limbs enabled him to perform many feats of wonderful dexterity where trees or ropes were in question or anything else to climb. At such exercises he certainly much more resembled a squirrel or a small monkey than a frog. I am not able to say with precision from what country Hop Frog originally came. It was from some barbarous region, however, that no person ever heard of, a vast distance from the court of our king. Hop Frog and a young girl very little less dwarfish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvellous dancer, had been forcibly carried off from their respective homes in adjoining provinces and sent as presents to the king by one of his ever-victorious generals. Under these circumstances it is not to be wondered at that a close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon became sworn friends— Hop Frog, who, although he made a great deal of sport, was by no means popular, had it not in his power to render Trippetta many services. But she, on account of her grace and exquisite beauty, although a dwarf, was universally admired and petted, so she possessed much influence, and never failed to use it whenever she could for the benefit of Hop Frog. On some grand state occasion, I forgot what, the king determined to have a masquerade, and whenever a masquerade or anything of that kind occurred at our court, then the talents, both of Hop Frog and Trippetta, were sure to be called into play. Hop Frog, in especial, was so inventive in the way of getting up pageants, suggesting novel characters, and arranging costumes for masked balls, that nothing could be done, it seems, without his assistance. The night appointed for the feat had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Trippetta's eye, with every kind of device which could possibly give eclat to a masquerade. The whole court was in a fever of expectation. As for costumes and characters, it might well be supposed that everybody had come to a decision on such points. Many had made up their minds as to what roles they should assume a week or even a month in advance, and, in fact, there was not a particle of indecision anywhere, except in the case of the king and his seven ministers." Why they hesitated, I never could tell, unless they did it by way of a joke. More probably, they found it difficult, on account of being so fat, to make up their minds. At all events, time flew, and, as a last resort, they sent for Trippetta and Hop Frog. When the two little friends obeyed the summons of the king, they found him sitting at his wine with the seven members of his cabinet council— but the monarch appeared to be in a very ill humor. He knew that Hop Frog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness, and madness is no comfortable feeling. But the king loved his practical jokes and took pleasure in forcing Hop Frog to drink and, as the king called it, to be merry. "'Come here, Hop Frog," said he, as the jester and his friend entered the room. "'Swallow this bumper to the health of your absent friends.' Here Hop Frog sighed, 
And then let us have the benefit of your invention. We want characters, characters, man, something novel, out of the way. We are wearied with this everlasting sameness. Come, drink, the wine will brighten your wits. Hopfrog endeavored, as usual, to get up a jest in reply to these advances from the king, but the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, and the command to drink to his absent friends forced the tears to his eyes. Many large, bitter drops fell into the goblet as he took it, humbly from the hand of the tyrant. Ha, 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 roared the latter as the dwarf reluctantly drained the beaker. See what a glass of good wine can do. Why, your eyes are shining already. Poor fellow. His large eyes gleamed rather than shone, for the effect of wine on his excitable brain was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked round upon the company with a half-insane stare. They all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. "'And now to business,' said the prime minister, a very fat man. "'Yes,' said the king. "'Come lend us your assistance. "'Characters, my fine fellow. "'We stand in need of characters, all of us. <laughs> "'Ha, ha, ha!' And as this was seriously meant for a joke, his laugh was chorused by the seven. Hopfrog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. "'Come, come!' said the king impatiently. "'Have you nothing to suggest?' "'I am endeavouring to think of something novel,' replied the dwarf abstractly, for he was quite bewildered by the wine. "'Endeavouring!' cried the tyrant fiercely. "'What do you mean by that? "'Ah, I perceive!' "'You're sulky, and want more wine. Here, drink this!' And he poured out another goblet full and offered it to the cripple, who merely gazed at it, gasping for breath. "'Drink, I say!' shouted the monster. "'Or by the fiends!' The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtiers smirked. Trippetta. Pale as a corpse, advanced to the monarch's seat, and, falling on her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her, for some moments, in evident wonder at her audacity. He seemed quite at a loss what to do or say, how most becomingly to express his indignation. At last, without uttering a syllable, he pushed her violently from him and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor girl got up the best she could and, not daring even to sigh, resumed her position at the foot of the table. There was a dead silence for about half a minute, during which the falling of a leaf or of a feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted grating sound, which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room. What, what, what are you making that noise for? demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered, in great measure, from his intoxication, and looking fixedly but quietly into the tyrant's face, merely ejaculated, I? I? How could it have been me? "'The sound appeared to come from without,' observed one of the courtiers. "'I fancy it was the parrot at the window, wetting his bill upon his cage wires.' "'True,' replied the monarch, as if much relieved by the suggestion. "'But on the honour of a knight, I could have sworn that it was the gritting of this vagabond's teeth.' Hereupon the dwarf laughed. The king was too confirmed a joker to object to anyone's laughing, and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. The monarch was pacified, and having drained another bumper with no very perceptible ill effect, Hopfrog entered at once and with spirit into the plans for the masquerade. "'I cannot tell what was the association of idea,' observed he, very tranquilly, and as if he had never tasted wine in his life. "'But just after your majesty had struck the girl and thrown the wine in her face, 
just after your majesty had done this, and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into my mind a capital diversion, one of my own country frolics, often enacted among us at our masquerades, but here it will be new altogether. Unfortunately, however, it requires a company of eight persons, and— Here we are, cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence. Eight to a fraction, I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight chain orangutans, and it really is excellent sport, if well enacted— "'We will enact it,' remarked the king, drawing himself up and lowering his eyelids. "'The beauty of the game,' continued Hopfrog, "'lies in the fright it occasions among the women.' "'Capital!' roared in chorus the monarch and his ministry. "'I will equip you with orangutans,' proceeded the dwarf. "'Leave all that to me. "'The resemblance shall be so striking "'that the company of masqueraders will take you for real beasts, "'and, of course,' They will be as much terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite, claimed the king. Hop, frog, I will make a man of you. The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jangling. You are supposed to have escaped en masse from your keepers. Your majesty cannot conceive the effect produced at a masquerade by eight chained orangutans, imagined to be real ones by most of the company, and rushing in with savage cries among the crowd of delicately and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrast is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put in execution the scheme of Hop Frog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, but effective enough for his purposes. The animals in question had, at the epoch of my story, very rarely been seen in any part of the civilized world, and as the imitations made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous, their truthfulness to nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitting stockinette shirts and drawers. They were then saturated with tar. At this stage of the process, someone of the party suggested feathers, but the suggestion was at once overruled by the dwarf, who soon convinced the eight, by ocular demonstration, that the hair of such a brute as the orangutan was much more efficiently represented by flax. A thick coating of the latter was accordingly plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now procured. First it was passed about the waist of the king and tied, then about another of the party and also tied, then about all successively in the same manner. When this chaining arrangement was complete and the party stood as far apart from each other as possible, they formed a circle— and to make all things appear natural, Hop Frog passed the residue of the chain in two diameters at right angles across the circle, after the fashion adopted at the present day by those who capture chimpanzees or other large apes in Borneo. The grand saloon in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room, very lofty, and receiving the light of the sun only through a single window at top. At night, the season for which the apartment was especially designed, it was illuminated principally by a large chandelier, depending by a chain from the center of the skylight, and lowered, or elevated, by means of a counterbalance as usual, but, in order not to look unsightly, this ladder passed outside the cupola and over the roof. The arrangements of the room had been left to Tripita's superintendence, but in some particulars, it seems, she had been guided by the calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf. At his suggestion it was that, on this occasion, the chandelier was removed. 
its waxen drippings, which in weather so warm was quite impossible to prevent, would have been seriously detrimental to the rich dresses of the guests, who, on account of the crowded state of the saloon, could not all be expected to keep out of its centre, that is to say, from under the chandelier. Additional sconces were set in various parts of the hall, out of the way, and a flambeau emitting sweet odor was placed in the right hand of each of the caryatides that stood against the wall, some fifty or sixty altogether. The eight orangutans, taking Hop Frog's advice, waited patiently until midnight, when the room was thoroughly filled with masqueraders, before making their appearance. No sooner had the clock ceased striking, however, than they rushed— or rather rolled in altogether, for the impediments of their chains caused most of the party to fall and all to stumble as they entered. The excitement among the masqueraders was prodigious and filled the heart of the king with glee. As had been anticipated, there were not a few of the guests who supposed the ferocious-looking creatures to be beasts of some kind in reality, if not precisely orangutans. Many of the women swooned with affright, and had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all weapons from the saloon, his party might soon have expiated their frolic in their blood. As it was, a general rush was made for the doors, but the king had ordered them to be locked immediately upon his entrance, and, at the dwarf's suggestion, the keys had been deposited with him. While the tumult was at its height, and each masquerader attentive only to his own safety, for, in fact, there was much real danger from the pressure of the excited crowd, the chain by which the chandelier ordinarily hung and which had been drawn up on its removal might have been seen very gradually to descend until its hooked extremity came within three feet of the floor. Soon after this, the king and his seven friends, having reeled about the hall in all directions, found themselves at length in its centre, and, of course, in immediate contact with the chain. While they were thus situated, the dwarf, who had followed noiselessly at their heels, inciting them to keep up the commotion, took hold of their own chain at the intersection of the two portions which crossed the circle diametrically and at right angles. Here, with the rapidity of thought, he inserted the hook from which the chandelier had been wont to depend, and in an instant, by some unseen agency, the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach, and, as an inevitable consequence, to drag the orangutans together in close connection and face to face. The masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm, and, beginning to regard the whole matter as a well-contrived pleasantry, set up a loud shout of laughter at the predicament of the apes. "'Leave them to me!' now screamed Hop Frog, his shrill voice making it easily heard through all the din. "'Leave them to me! I fancy I know them. If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell who they are.' Here, scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall— when, seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatides, he returned as he went to the center of the room, leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head, and thence clambered a few feet up the chain, holding down the torch to examine the group of orangutans, and still screaming, I shall soon find out who they are. And now, while the whole assembly the apes included, were convulsed with laughter. The jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle, when the chain flew violently up for about thirty feet, dragging with it the dismayed and struggling orangutans, and leaving them suspended in mid-air between the skylight and the floor. Hop Frog, clinging to the chain as it rose, still maintained his relative position in respect to the eight maskers, and still, as if nothing were the matter— continued to thrust his torch down toward them, as though endeavoring to discover who they were. So thoroughly astonished was the whole company at this ascent, that a dead silence of about a minute's duration ensued. It was broken by just such a low, harsh grating sound as had before attracted the attention of the king and his counsellors when the former threw the wine in the face of Trippetta. 
but on the present occasion there could be no question as to whence the sound issued. It came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf, who ground them and gnashed them as he foamed at the mouth and glared with an expression of maniacal rage into the upturned countenances of the king and his seven companions. Aha! said at length the infuriated jester. Ha <laughs> ha! I begin to see who these people are now! Here, pretending to scrutinize the king more closely, he held the flambeau to the flaxen coat which enveloped him, and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame. In less than half a minute the whole eight orangutans were blazing fiercely amid the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below, horror-stricken, and without the power to render them the slightest assistance. At length the flames, suddenly increasing in virulence, forced the jester to climb higher up the chain to be out of their reach, and, as he made his movement, the crowd again sank for a brief instant into silence. The dwarf seeked his opportunity and once more spoke. "'I now see distinctly,' he said, "'what manner of people these maskers are. "'They are a great king and his seven privy counsellors, "'a king who does not scruple to strike a defenceless girl, "'and his seven counsellors who abet him in the outrage. "'As for myself, I am simply Hop Frog, the jester, "'and this is my last jest.' Owing to the high combustibility of both the flax and the tar to which it adhered, the dwarf had scarcely made an end of his brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete. The eight corpses swung in their chains, a fetid, blackened, hideous, and indistinguishable mass. The cripple hurled his torch at them, clambered leisurely to the ceiling, and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trippetta, stationed on the roof of the saloon, had been the accomplice of her friend in his fiery revenge, and that together they effected their escape to their own country, for neither was seen again. Picture the scene. I walk past you. You look up, surprised. You're back early. John is haunted. You blink. Shake your head. What? I walk past again. Armed this time. John is haunted. And head back out. It's 700, folks. Let's get weird. We've never run Poe before last week. This is for two reasons. The first is that I work for a triumvirate of dread geniuses who care a lot about their jobs, their listeners, and the genre itself. We live, arguably now more than ever, in a world of firehoses of content. Our editors pick the best stories, the ones that sink their teeth in and won't let go. Sometimes those are old classics, sometimes modern classics. I refer you and everyone else in the world near enough to Coven of Dead Girls, one of the most horrific best stories and narrations we have ever run. New is good. New is often fantastic. The second reason we've never run Poe up to now is simple. It's also the same reason I never play cards with Sean, aside from the fact I have no idea how to play. The editors always have something up their sleeve. And what better author to celebrate 700 episodes with? What better guide into the past and future of horror than the dark daddy of the modern era himself? Who better than Poe to usher us around this particular corner, especially when you consider this slightly less well-known example of his work. Hopfrog is a perfect example of the breadth of the field, so let's plant the first flag in Poe's time and take a look at how people are described here. Hopfrog himself is the butt of every joke, a man whose physical stature and condition is endlessly mocked and whose partner is threatened. He's powerless, but also largely untouchable, occupying the exact same difficult liminal position as King Lear's Fool, but arguably far less lucky, and certainly, at least at first, far less empowered. Then there's Trepetta, or rather, there isn't. 
Trepetta is a character here, the same way Penelope Pitstop is in the Wacky Races. The only difference being Trepetta doesn't actually get to yell HELP as much, or yell anything, or really do anything, besides maybe be an accomplice in Hop Frog's just astoundingly brutal revenge. Finally, there's the king and his bros, for bros these men assuredly are. Poe goes out of his way to make them all just terrible people. Not just evil, but easily tricked and manipulated. Oh, and fat. Did he mention how fat they are? They're corpulent. They're just so fat, folks. If Trepetta is a metaphorical sad face drawn on a stick, the king and the king's men are villains cut straight from central casting. Or at least, that's how they appear now. The truth is that our window of perception of what works and what does not, of what offends and what doesn't, shifts constantly. Case in point, I'm doing bedtime stories on Twitch every Wednesday night at the moment, 10pm GMT, check your show notes for listings, and they tend to be older horror stories. This week, we did two short Ambrose Beers pieces. I love Beers, and I'm really enjoying digging into his back catalogue, and these are both great, both clever, and both just word musely seriously it was a real effort to make them work and flow and at the time they were written Beers was graceful he was Fred Astaire with punctuation likewise Poe let's run that list again Hop Frog's physical conditions are as far as the king is concerned Hop Frog all that he is he's weak he's small the king is better than him that's all that counts that sort of approach to folks with conditions like Hot Frogs has echoed down the decades. Through Todd Browning's freaks to elements of carny culture itself, and finishing with the assumption, even now, that the physically scarred or physically different are, by definition, evil. Which is one of the ways in which The Goonies is in fact one of the most revolutionary family movies ever made, but, like Alton Brown likes to point out, that's a whole other episode. That approach is achingly slowly changing. What isn't, and interestingly, what gets obfuscated behind it here, is the implication of Hop Frog's massive, almost superhuman rage. The King and his bros are undoubtedly terrible, abusive people. Tarring them, feathering them, setting fire to them, and hanging their burnt corpses from the chandelier is undoubtedly so far from a proportionate response, it's not even in the same solar system. Hop Frog may be a character we view as more than his shape now, but he's certainly not a character we can view as more than his anger. I'd love to say Trepetta is different, but that would require Trepetta to be present in the story. An agency-less damsel, as we talk about above, there is one thing Poe tries, which has surprising echoes of modern horror. Namely, that Trepetta may not be silent. She may be planning. Poe names her as a likely accomplice, but what if she's the mastermind? Better still, what if the ambiguity over her role is the point? An invisible threat unseen not just in the night, but because of who she is and how she looks, hiding in plain sight. That's nuanced, interesting stuff, even if there's the absence of evidence for it as evidence. Likewise, the odd nature of her relationship with Hot Frog really resonates for a 2020 audience. That presents as unusually modern, and it's, despite being based on the same absence of character we could so easily be annoyed by, oddly impressive and interesting. Finally, the constant references to the king and the king's bros being fat and evil and not clever, and did we mention fat? This one, my friends, can safely be punted into the heart of the sun. The assumption that folks of Hot Frog's size are evil is lazy. The assumption that fat people are all evil or jolly is at least as lazy. There's no redemption here, no motivation. There's a waistline instead of a punchline. And again, that echoes down the years to us. So why run this story? Well, come with me now on a journey through time and space to our second flag, the one planted in 2020. Here we can see all these faults with the story, all these possible assets, and also some interesting new context provided for us by our old friend, Linear Time. Eat the rich, or tar, feather, and set fire to them is not a new idea. Neither is the revenge narrative or the concept of escaping into the night with the one you love, or at the very least, the one you choose to stand next to. 
Everyone from Malcolm in the Middle to Sarah Pinborough's The Death House has done that. And again, this is one of the places where it began. Also, the feel of the story, the tone, the grit of the stone walls, and the smell of flambe Kingbro. This is high-end, high-intensity, high-image stuff. This is Jallo. This is classic Italian horror. This is the Saw franchise. This is Splatterpunk, long before the concept had a name. This is, when viewed from here, looking back there, revolutionary, essential, fundamental. Art is appreciated at distance, assets and flaws alike. This story has some major assets and a couple of serious flaws, but it's never dull and it lingers in exactly the way its leads don't. Terrifying, overwrought, brutal, and still there, a presence in the corner both in our minds and in our haunted, but by no means always for bad reasons, genre. And that's why I'm back early. So thanks, Mr. Poe. Not just for the good stuff you wrought, but the changes, good and bad, that begin with or are focused with your work. Thanks to John, our wonderful reader. Thanks to Marty, our ever-impressive, magnificent audio producer. Massive thanks to Sean, Karen, Alex, and the rest of the team. And thanks to you. I've been here for over 650 episodes now, and I have never had a better job than this, or one that's taught me more, as this week's episode demonstrates. Plus, the love of my life came into my life through this show. Hi, Marguerite. I love you. That's a debt I could never repay, but I'm going to have a lot of fun working it off. So, see you in 700 episodes? Oh, real quick, please donate if you can. Not only does it help cover all our author, server, and staff costs, but our next funding goal, once we reach it, will pay our slushes who need it and deserve it. And you get special prizes when you donate or subscribe to us. Seriously, you do. There's a huge vault of free audio you can access. Donate or subscribe through Feed the Pod at pseudopod.org, which links to PayPal, or via Patreon. Links, as ever, in the show notes. You folks are amazing. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for helping us create for you. We'll see you next week when, as now, we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Thanks this week to Mr. Poe, to Marty, our amazing editorial team, and you. Next week we have Technicolor by John Langan, narrated by George Robb, and audio produced by the incredible Chelsea. We leave you this week with this quote from the telltale heart that which you mistake for madness is but an over acuteness of the senses see you in seven days folks have fun it's a pseudopod it's a big foot it's all about podcasts these days